Yes, you're very welcome along to the Huddle Breakdown. Enda here in the company of Juco James. Alan Morrison isn't with us. He's on a beach somewhere enjoying a nice couple of beers in celebration, James, in celebration that once again, Rangers were coming. Once again, they were coming. They were coming hard this time. But once again, they have slipped up and given Celtic the edge going in to the final stretch of the season with their defeat to Ross County. Celtic, on the other hand, were victorious over St. Mirren, a 3-0 victory at Celtic Park with the pitch covered in garbage. Um, James, firstly, like I, I used an Americanism there, garbage. Like In terms of on-the-field action, the most exciting part in the first half was watching the flyers and banners and rubbish all flying around the pitch. It was, but for, before we get into the game, I just in case Alan listens to this, I want to remind him that when he wakes up from his day drinking binge, uh, to reapply sunblock because it's you know <laughs> our people. We need we need to make sure that we get proper protection uh, when we're gallivanting around beaches, drinking too much during the day. Um, so yeah, I mean I, that was wild. Um, but you know, before we went live, I mean it it really was a tale of two halves. And I think part of that's, you know, could reasonably be, be misattributed given we've had so many of these where, you know, we play really well in one half and the other half, you just rather forget. And I, I really do think that the wind was the primary factor of that in the first half. Um, And if you just look at, you know, again, some of the numbers uh, in the first half, it, it was, we had one shot, uh, St. Mirren won the XG game in the first half, barely. Uh, they had two shots. None of them were really good by either team. Um, and then in the second half, we had 18 shots. They had zero. And it was uh, basically two and a half in XG and obviously the, the goals. Um, the other thing I'll say is I was going to do a thread on Twitter and I just got lazy and didn't do it <clears throat> in uh, before the game is – you know, I run my little dopey uh, attribution model thing. And I think St. Mirren and Robinson display um, one of the bigger managerial, I I shouldn't say managerial because people conflate that with recruitment too, um, head coach quality in the league this season. I mean, I think he's done a really good job. Um, And in that first half with the wind kind of aiding them, um, you know, the way that they played defensively, they, they actually have run the third highest defensive line in the league this season on average. Um, I mean, they're, they're not really aggressive going forward. They don't high press a ton, but they run kind of a higher middle block, if that makes sense, you know, closer to the midway line. Um, and they gave us a lot of problems with the wind uh, impairing us during that first half. And I, so again, I, I, I presume that they would at least give us a battle for quite a period of time in the game. Um, that was without knowing that there was going to be gale force winds in our face in the first half uh, and, and and dodging all the rubbish, uh, the garbage, as you would say, and uh, um, mm. flying about the pitch. So, yeah, that that's kind of from a high level. I think that's kind of how the game broke down. Well, that's sort of the, the difference between um, data analytics and stats in that, if you just look at stats, then you would say, oh, well, Celtic were really bad in the first half and St. Mirren were really good in the first yeah, half. But in reality, that, that's always my pet peeve. Always one of my pet what's peeves. What's the context but... of these numbers? And the numbers, the context of that was a gale force win. Um, there is that aspect as well of like, as a St. Mirren, as the St. Mirren team, as the captain or whatever, when it comes to the toss, do you stay with the wind in the first half? Do you go with the wind in the first half and hope that you get a goal and hope then that you can bet in uh, when uh, Celtic have the wind? Or do you do the opposite? Do you force Celtic to play into the wind, hope that they get tired out by the second half? Um, it's obviously easier to keep a clean sheet, as we saw when you uh, have the Gale Force wind to your advantage. So <clears throat> that aspect of things is uh, an underrated thing, I would say, in Scotland, is that the weather is a bit of an equalizer at times. And it was for the first 45 minutes. Yeah. I, I actually agree with that strategy, meaning um, the, I, I think trying to get the goal in the first half makes sense. And then if you're going to get pinned back because of the wind anyway, it's better to, you know, 
it's better to have a a lead to defend <laughs> versus you know being down two nil and hoping to catch back up in a in a wind dated second half. So I actually agree with that. And if, and if you look at the nature of the two shots that they did have, you know they they were kind of breakaway. You know they they were kind of wind dated. Um, you know they didn't do all that much with them. Again, I would I would argue that more has more to do with the quality of the players that they have. Um, but they, you know, they, they had a lot of like sequences of play where something more could have come of it. Um, so, you know, and, and if you just think about it from a positional perspective and set plays being the perpetual, um, potential equalizer for, for teams against us, uh, domestically is you would think with the wind, you'd have more of a chance to get long throws and corners and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I think they were smart. And, and again, I generally, I think that's. I think Robinson has overall been a, a pretty smart head coach this season. Uh, so yeah, I, th- I think they, I think they did mostly what they could to try and maximize their, their chances of winning. Um, mm. But as we'll get on to, I mean, it's just quite the hill to climb for them <laughs> with our barrage in in um, in the second half. There were some interesting um, selections in the. In the team, I guess one of them was injury forced, and Navratsky coming in at centre back for Liam Scales, and then Yang started the 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 game uh, on the on the left wing with Kun on the right, and it was incredibly frustrating to watch in the first half. It has to be said, having two players that both needed to cut in on their stronger foot um, against that wind, it's just, you're just always going to end up having to recycle the ball because ultimately, when you cut in, they're they're closing down the space, they're closing the gaps, so it's it's. It's just not going to work. And you're not going to smash one in uh, using the force of the wind if you're playing against it. So I, I didn't really see the logic in that one. But starting with the defense with Navratsky, again, it's so hard to judge a player off these games because, I mean, St. Mirren really didn't offer that much going forward, especially in the second half. But comfortability on the ball, uh, rustiness still, definitely some rustiness there. But in terms of what he brings in, in in comparison to skills, how did you think he did? Oh, I thought he was fine. Uh, to your point, I don't think that this is uh, the game that's going to um, stress test his relative weaknesses, meaning that him and scales are almost inverted, meaning that, you know, scales, his relative strengths are kind of on the ground defending, um, you know, kind of com- combativeness, tackling. Uh, whereas Navratsky's is more, that's probably his relative weakness. I'm not saying he's bad at it. I'm just saying that compared to scales, he's probably, um, you know, a relative weakness and, and on the ball kind of inverts and, uh, the, the positives with Navratsky are more so those kind of line breaking passes and the, the quickness of getting the ball forward. Um, that comes with some risk. And I think that's where ultimately for the game, that risk was, you know, he did a good job. I mean, they, at times he's had, uh, you know, some pretty bad giveaways uh, in, in trying to be quick and going going forward. And, you know, again, doing that against St. Marin doesn't have the risk profile of doing against a higher level opponent, first of all. So, you know, when he takes those risks, it's it's the risk rewards better against St. Marin. Um, but he, to his credit, I mean, it just he, he was pretty he was pretty good. I mean, he didn't have. Um, an, an inordinate number of misplaced passes or, you know, uh, what I would call dumb reads, you know, <laughs> missing a defender who's going to cut off a, a, a passing lane, that kind of thing. Uh, because that that was, you know, when I saw the lineup and then I realized what was going on with the wind, you know, um, in honor of, of Allen's absence. I mean, that that is kind of a potential toxic combination on that left side, meaning that, you know, Yang can give the ball away quite a bit. We know Hitate can do that with his risk profile. Um, and then you throw Navratsky in there with his passing uh, profile. And, you know, um, again, even collectively, because it's against St. Mirren, it's probably not going to be a huge problem because he, they're not really a counterattacking team either. I mean, even against teams that aren't, you know, um, Celtic or Rangers, they, they haven't really been um, all that proficient in counterattacking this season against other uh, league opponent. So I, I didn't think that was going to be a huge problem. Um, fortunately, it didn't turn out to, to be that. But yeah, I thought Navrosky was was good. But again, um, playing at 
Kilmarnock, I'd probably be a little bit more concerned, for example, <laughs> um, in that kind of game versus what we saw over the weekend. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, really what's the test is going to be is going to be, is he going to keep his place until the end of the season? And if he does that, uh, does that mean that Brendan Rodgers trusts him to throw him into the derby? Because that's where he will be targeted. That's where we've seen Lager Bielka f- falter. Um, so that's the ultimate test of Nebraska now for the next couple of weeks. Because as much as people can say that skills isn't up to the standard that's needed for Celtic, and I'm not going on PR mode here, I'm just being like real about this. As much as people want to say that he's not up to the standard, that may be true, but he's still doing something that's keeping these these guys out of the team, including Navratsky. Navratsky's been fit, so the test of him now is can he put together consistent performances to stay in the team now? I agree. And, and, you know, in fairness to Navratsky, I mean, I, I think just based off of public comments and, you know, kind of track record as well is that, Rogers values some degree of consistency in the center back pairing. And in fairness to all the center backs, you know, the uh, gauging how they perform with Carter Vickers as their partner versus when it's one of them, the others uh, is, is, you know, kind of apples and oranges. So, you know, Navratsky looking better um, over the weekend, again, relative to the opponent those factors, but also having Carter Vickers next to him and, um, and Taylor and Johnston in a kind of more of a settled, you know, back, back five. Um, I, I suspect again, because of what Rogers has said that this was, you know, assuming that this was just a knock or a short-term thing with scales, although he's had a couple of them recently. So, you know, that could suggest he's got something nagging that's potentially more chronic. I don't know. Again, who knows? They don't really disclose this stuff um, very well. But um, yeah, so my guess is that Scales will come back in as soon as and and when he's fit. Um, But I, you know, I I don't think I'd be alarmed with Navratsky because we're going to play St. Marin again, uh, St. Marin away, probably. I think that would be fine. Um, You know, the rest of the uh, Post split fixtures, I think, would be a little bit more, you know, if it's end, it looks like I think it's going to end up Dundee. That one I'd probably be okay with, although they seem to be a little bit better on the counter attack, uh, a little bit more athleticism up top. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, as a patchwork against that kind of opposition, fine with Nebrotsky, but I, I'd actually be surprised um, unless it's an injury that that uh, Scales doesn't return. Yeah, so would I. So would I, given his his track record this season under Rodgers and what Rodgers has been saying about him. So we'll we'll wait and see on that one. In terms of the midfield, it's a little bit more straightforward. Rio Hatate clearly makes a difference, and he did so this weekend again. So, like, I mean, it, w- we should be doing everything in our power to keep him fit until the end of the season because he, he has transformed, or at least from the eye test, he gives more energy within the midfield, gives more options within the midfield and takes some of the responsibility off Matt O'Reilly. Yeah, his his um, adeptness at finding space, dropping, um, being able to carry the ball, that was something that Alan and I talked about where we were deficient in ball progression um, with you know a mix of, let's say, Awada, Bernardo and O'Reilly. And that was requiring O'Reilly to drop deep more uh, and in ball progression isn't really his strength either. So it was, um, you know, it was more of a, a, a numbers game that we were being forced to play as opposed to, you know, just McGregor or just uh, Hatate, e- either through pass, quickness of thought, quickness of pass, or picking up the ball and carrying at 20, 30, 40 yards at a, at a clip. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's certainly added that. And then we saw obviously with the goal, I mean, he, he's, He's always got that uh, potential for the that moment of, you know, brilliance from a skill perspective. Um, and when they come off, that's you know, that's what we always say. It's game changing potentially, uh, and it certainly was. I mean, that was just a brilliant finish. Um, so yeah, having having that wild card domestically, it really is a um, a game changer potentially. The the you know probably I would say the two opponents left that 
you know, you worry about risk reward with him potentially. I'm not saying it's, you know, it can flip either way. Uh, or again, Kilmarnock and, um, and in the last Derby, um, mm. but the way Rangers have been playing and that, uh, tactical genius Clement has been, uh, selecting his, his side. <laughs> I, I, uh, less concerned about that than I would have otherwise been, but, um, so yeah, I, I huge game changer in in uh, our build up, and then also to your point, kind of unleashing O'Reilly a little more, playing that more, almost like a second striker role that he's been, you know, earlier in the season he's kind of getting into the box, you know, making those runs, late runs. Um, so yeah, it's it's been good to see that kind of return. Mm. Here's a question that's going to drive people insane. Um, <laughs> So Celtic's results uh, in the last five games have been um, four two win against Livingston in the cup, three uh, one win against St Johnson, a three nil win away to Livingston, uh, the three three draw or the three three loss I should say against Rangers, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, and the three nil win against St Mirren. Results are clearly up. I test would suggest Celtic are playing better. What do the numbers say? Are there are Celtic? looking more cohesive and coherent and lucky are they are they playing better based on the numbers yeah so, so the underlying metrics are trending in the right direction um you know shockingly you're when, when your better players are playing that um no way can, can be a material difference and and i think that's where you know again to your point before uh, the difference between data and and uh, uh proficient uh, analysis is, you know, when you look at things over a period of time, whether it's Clement's arrival versus Celtic the entire season, um, you know, I've talked about this concept of replacement level, you know, and, and so I, I would say that the, the reason why we are materially different than what our season long averages would suggest are um, twofold. One is, um, the re- return of players and um, not only that, but the gap between what we were getting versus what we are getting now, meaning that, um, you know, Bernardo had some moments of, of brilliance, like in the, the latest Derby with that pass to uh, Ida, which again was, it was a great pass, but overall I would argue he's kind of been below replacement level of a Celtic midfielder. <laughs> um, and with Hatate coming back, I'd say he's, you know, kind of maybe right around or domestically a little bit above that. Um, and then on the wing, Kuhn has, once he's gotten fit and over his medical issues, he's gone to at least replacement level, if not a little higher. And again, for a large part of the season, we were getting below what you would expect from Celtic wingers. Uh, and you throw Carter Vickers in there, again, above level, uh, one of our better center backs in, in recent history, versus those different mixes that we had at various points. So that you, you could only, you know, um, expect the overall performance level to, to increase. The other thing I'll say um, is uh, Joe Hart's non-shot stopping. Um, performance levels have picked up materially since December to his credit. Um, he's still not doing great in that capacity, but, you know, I think in fairness uh, with our tongue in cheek insults of him as a potted potted plant <laughs> earlier in the season, which again, I think were accurate at that time uh, to his credit, he has improved in those facets of play uh, to the point where he's, you know, kind of around average uh, for, um, a, a, you know, a, a league level keeper. Whereas before, I mean, he, it was a significant detriment to um, the level of play. And his shot stopping is kind of, you know, about expected to a little below that. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, th- these non shot stopping aspects of keeper play, I think, continue to be dramatically under appreciated, misunderstood aren't quantified accurately. You know, the, the, I think this is one of the areas where I test um, 
disproportionately skews towards shot stopping. I think that's why the perception of Butlin is way out of and had been up until the last couple of weeks where I think it's softened a little bit. But uh, if you look at kind of comprehensive gauges of keeper play, um, Hart's now surpassed Butlin on the season. And that's not because his shot stopping has been better. It's because Butlin has been so atrocious, <laughs> particularly in the last month, in non-shot stopping elements, meaning – you know, uh, you saw it in the Ross County game that they just lost. When you dump saves right out in the middle of the front of your goal mouth, you know, that that counts as a good shot stop. But then there's the parrying aspect of that. Uh, we saw that in the, the Derby match where probably a younger, more athletic sweeper keeper may come and get that ball that Tavernier clunks off of Maeda's shin. You know, so the and and you know, um, there's the, the ball at your feet and making those kind of errors. And he, he has one of the highest error rates, um, in Europe, <laughs> uh, for the season. So I, I think, you know, having been critical of heart at times this season, I think it's only fair to point out that, um, particularly in the facet of play where he was showing most, um, elements of weakness, He's really picked up, and I, I hope it continues, obviously, uh, for the remainder of the season. But uh, whether it was a, a coaching issue or, um, you know, a focal point of training, whatever, I mean, he's really done a better job at decision-making and, you know, knowing when and deciding when to come for crosses and executing on them, punching well, you know, that type of thing. Um, again, not at a world-beater level, but – we didn't need that, quite frankly. What we needed with him was to reduce that risk, and I think he's done a, an excellent job at at um, at doing that. Yeah, and I think that's like that's what we were looking for throughout the season from everybody. It wasn't that because I think there has to be a little bit of a an acceptance after a certain period of time in this season because of how bad it got that as bad as it gets. We don't need to be perfect. We just need to be better than we are at the minute. And that's kind of showing now in the in the league table. Was Celtic didn't need to be perfect over this, uh, this stretch of games over the last two months. They just needed to be better than they were. And a better, better than we were is getting us from drawing loads of games to winning winning games again. And if you're seeing that with, with Hart, you're seeing that with Carter Vickers, a couple of players coming back in to... Um, add to that little cocktail and suddenly now you're taking the team that was really performing at about 40%, maybe 50% to a 65, 70%. And it's, it's just the way that the league is that Celtic at 65, 70% of capacity or of quality is still better than most of the league. And probably what we've seen in the derbies is taking that to an even more extreme where we've actually performed really really well and the outcome has been uh, two wins and a draw so like that's that's where we're at with the season so really what we need now after the result Ross County pulled off I think that was the first win they've I think it's the first time they've ever beaten Rangers it's the first time in like I think I saw that yep. yep so for them to do that at this time of the season that now fully puts the league in Celtic's hands going into the derby and if Celtic can perform uh, one more time in the derby match, then the league title is likely going to be theirs. Yeah, and and, and that's you know it, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, styles make fights. We always say, or I always say that. And um, Ross County actually leads the league in shots off of counterattacks. So, um, you know, going back to the the this issue of uh, selection and some of the strategy, strategery from uh, Clement, you know, going with the midfield he went with, some of the um, issues we've been talking about with Goldson's, looks like kind of a normal age-based decline. Uh, Tavernier, same thing, not and, and working off of a relatively low base from a defensive perspective. Um, you know, Dow being in there, uh, mystifying to me. Um, why they haven't had Sterling in midfield more is, is you know, um, kind of funny, I think actually. So, um, yeah, so styles make fights and that, that, um, 
left them vulnerable, and, and that's a relative weakness that they've had at times. And when you throw in the mix of, of, of those um, players and Butlin having another <laughs> uh, screamer of a game, uh, in, in, particularly in his non-shot stopping aspects, you know, again, long may it continue. Um, and yeah, I, I think we've kind of returned to a baseline of performance levels where us dropping points is going to be uh, less likely. But again, we're not this refined engine now, particularly with Maeda out. We can talk about that in a, in a minute if you want. Yet another uh, soft tissue injury. Bad one, too. It sounds like, I, again, I, they haven't said anything. But, you know, when Rogers mentioned tendon, uh, you know, that, that usually means some sort of tear. Um, at, at the and he, he mentioned the high up on the on the hamstring, so that that revisits kind of the type of injury that uh, Kyogo had, and whether uh, the degree of tear depends on whether or not it requires surgery and recovery time frame. Um, so, you know, does that kind of um, drag us down a little bit again? Back to this issue of replacement level, um, or, or what level of player we're going to get defensively on that side now? You know, again. That's not Hitate strength. Um, so, you know, how's that going to shake out of it's yang, some mix of Yang and Palma, most likely. Um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, n- never ending trying to figure out what the what the relative mix is going to be. Um, but, I, you know, again, I, I think we have the, the, the two fixtures in, in the last five that are the glaring standout ones. I don't worry that much about hearts. Um, you know, with Shanklin, it's always a risk that, you know, they can, we can drop points against them if he has a kind of one of his worldly games. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, we don't lack chance creation against them. And with the return of these players, I would hope that we can score at least two, three, maybe even four goals. Um, so yeah, it comes back to the, that Kilmarnock and Derby match. Yeah, the ones that we are not scared of, but we're wary of. Um, given Mr. Clement's uh, reaction to the bit of fate just walking down the tunnel like a spoiled child, I think you could enter the realm of rattled. I think you could uh, use that word to describe him after that game. Yeah, you know, we we talked about this a um, couple months ago, which is the you know the first thing, th- this idea of both teams getting tested, both managers getting tested into a legitimate title race because you know as we discussed rogers only really only has had one um and you know was that this uh was that this the the, uh last day of the season i think when when liverpool lost the title that season if i recall correctly um and Uh, they they did and they didn't yeah they they lost it well before that in terms of mentally well right Right. But, and then Clement, you know, the, the leagues that, again, to his credit, he had a really good run in Belgium. I think it was in Belgium. Um, you know, none of those were down to the wire. I mean, the, his teams won comfortably. You know, the equivalent of post split wrapping it up, you know, in, in late April, <laughs> um, early May kind of thing. So, you know, and, and, and we know the players, you know, just by definition, even at Celtic, none of our players have really been through these kind of, um, you know, late season. Every single fixture is live or die. Uh, so so far, I would say, um, you know, skewing in our our favor. No no question about that. Um, and and Rogers seems to be, uh, you know, I'll, I'll Joe. He, he, he's acting like he's got some stank on his hang low. Uh, you know, he's got his swagger a little bit. And uh, yeah, Clement's response uh, to to the Ross County result was kind of the opposite of that. Um, so yeah, but you know, those are all these are all just factors, right? You know, some f- <laughs> some fluky red card at Kilmarnock, and all of this can flip and change uh, <laughs> uh, fast. Um, so these things are all kind of on the margin, but yeah, I'd, I'd say so far the evidence would suggest that the pendulum in that regards kind of tilted in our direction. 
I was thinking about this the other day, and I can't decide that if Celtic do go on to win this title, whether it's the greatest achievement of Brendan Rodgers' career or whether it's the greatest bottle job in Rangers' uh, short history. Um, and I think it's it's definitely in between the two. There's definitely a, a, a clear yeah. argument for both. Yeah, you know, again, I, that, that's like the, the post clement arrival. We were so poor, you know, we, we kind of gave them the opportunity to get back into the the, the title race. Um, a lot of that had to do with injuries and uh, how poor recruitment had been. Um, but, you know, there was some some decision-making um, that we, we talked about and questioned at the time, too. Um, and, you know, again, to Clement and Rangers' credit, they went on a, a run there to, to, to close that gap. Uh, but we gave them that opportunity. And now it's kind of the, fl- the inverse of that, right? I mean, they've been really poor the last month, I'd say. I mean, I think they only have two wins in, in the last month. Um, so they dropped quite a number of points. And again, to our credit, we're, we're uh, making them pay for that. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's as the pressure cooker turns up, as the heat goes up here, it'll, it'll be um, fun to see, or fascinating to see. It'll only be fun if it's one direction, but it'll be fascinating to see uh, who wilts. Um, but, you know, as we've seen in, in the Premier League, the English Premier League, you know, <laughs> as, uh, you can get kind of crazy results. Um, I mean, who would have thought Crystal Palace would have beaten Liverpool? You know, um, so, you know, as, as, as um, we get into these last five, six games, you know, there could still be some twists and turns. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't count our chickens quite yet um but yeah again i i uh the the trends are certainly favorable all right we said that we were going to keep this short and sweet anything that you want to bring up before we finish this off without alan you know it really just it's like playing with yang on the wing you know we're we're basically playing with two men up top with uh, a winger just doing nothing yeah yeah we're we're um definitely uh below replacement level without alan but um but yeah no that's it that's it i mean look looking forward to the finding out who we play uh, um you know the post split fixtures and obviously we'll maybe return uh, i think alan might be back friday we'll, we'll have a look towards the uh the cup game over the weekend against aberdeen um but yeah no that's good good, good overall good performance i mean i again i i think it's it's not um Given all the trends that we're talking about, I, I mean, I, I agree. I'd like to see a full kind of 80, 90 minute game where we're, everything's clicking. Um, in the abstract, obviously not great because it didn't happen again. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the rubbish and the wind. I mean, how, how can you see when, those, when you have streamers blowing in your face? You know, how, how can you deliver those passes to a wide open Hitate when you know, you've got confetti and streamers in your face. So give them a little bit of slack. Yeah. I think it's a clock in clock out sort of situation of, you know, it's the exact same for this podcast clock in clock out. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing crazy. There's nothing crazy. We need to talk about really. Like it was no. just a run of the mill three, no win job done. Let's move on to the next one. Rangers drop points. Happy days. We, we move on and we, we get closer to the, the split fixtures and uh, the run in for the title. So uh, Alan will be back with us uh, hopefully next week when he recovers from his long week of uh, drinking on the beach. So I hope he's enjoying that. And I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you did drop us a like, drop us a comment and subscribe to the channel on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, you can get your podcast wherever you want. It's on Spotify, iTunes or whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Uh, We will be back at some stage this week, potentially maybe next week, if not, and uh, we'll chat to you then. Good luck.